everybody. It is the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, your host, the content executive here at Higher Things. And uh, my friend, Pastor Brad Meyer is back. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm all right. We made it through Thanksgiving. Uh, we're, we're sort of dealing with all the colds that come this time of year, but it's it's Advent. I'm I'm really just excited for that. Uh, my my favorite hymns are all Advent hymns, and so um, I, I get to to sort of be a part of, of a church that that sings them and doesn't sort of hop straight to Christmas. It's 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 a lot of fun right now. Uh, we just we got everything sort of set up, and I'm just waiting for for snow. It's uh, it's actually how things, to me at least, are, are supposed to look. I think that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we talked philosophy, and uh, we're, we're hitting, what's the one today? Aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah, aesthetics. So so tell me if I'm wrong with this, uh, because I was born and raised in the Midwest, and I just, I, I lived in Texas for three years, in like South Texas in San Antonio, where... Uh, Christmas was 90 degrees. And to me, it always just felt a little off. And I'm not saying that there was snow where, you know, the manger was, but at the same time, to me, there, there's just sort of a Christmas vibe. Um, what's the difference between a vibe and an aesthetic? How about that? Well, okay, it depends on how you use the words, right? And yeah. this, this is the problem is that so many things in the 20th century, in a lot of terms, just kind of got redefined in the 20th century. But aesthetics really gets reduced to matters of taste, right? So hmm. the average person that says something's aesthetic, you know, something's beautiful, um, they mean that it's got like a vibe that I enjoy or whatever. I happen to have a taste that prefers this, right? Hmm. And in classically in philosophy, right, we understand aesthetics to be objective. And so um, Bethlehem, you know, can get some snow, right? It gets, it gets cool enough up there that they'll get a little bit kind of like certain parts of Texas will on occasion, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, we have to be very careful when we talk about this stuff, because the idea of attaching snow to the nativity of the Lord, right, that's a matter of taste and preference. Right. It's not an integral quality of what it is to celebrate Christmas or, or, you know, when it comes to the matters, when we talk about like worship in the church, you know, when we talk about our church services, how we appoint our churches, is it all just, hey, man, this is how, what I like, this is what I feel should be, or do we have a different standard that we bring to bear on this? And so whether we mean to or not, we are talking about aesthetics. We are talking about whether things are, you know, beautiful or not. And we do approach these questions as if there is an objectivity, but typically we approach it as if it's a rejection of ob objectivity. And so we go, can't possibly be, you know, universally beautiful. Therefore, let's just reduce this to whatever the majority wants or something like that. And, um, and you know, in classical thought, like goodness and truth and beauty, you know, this comes from Plato and Aristotle these three things go together. And then for, you know, the Christians who adopted this idea, um, we see this all cohering in God, right? So God makes things good. He bakes morality into creation. God makes things, you know, true, like all truth coheres in Jesus Christ. And then he also makes things beautiful. And, you know, if you, and it's easier in the natural world, right? So if I go, you know, a lot of people don't know this, you know, about the prairies, but the prairies are beautiful. You know, we think of beauty, we think of oceans, we think of mountains, we think of canyons. But you go stand on, you know, the one little hill out by my dad's farm in North Dakota that's like 20 feet tall, and it's the tallest point for dozens of miles in every direction. And you go stand on the top of this thing, and it's tall enough you can see over the trees and all the different farm sites, and you can see forever. And you see this giant, vast prairie and this huge, unending sky, and it's hard not to appreciate the majesty and the beauty of that. And that's an objective thing, right? It doesn't matter how I feel about it because it's, it impresses itself on me in a way that is objective, right? The sky is big, whether I want it to be or not. There's an order to it, whether I want there to be or not, you know, which is why when you get into the Greek philosophers, they're always talking about symmetry and they're talking about proportion and they're talking about all these kind of mathematical things as part of beauty, because again, all this stuff coheres together. I think it's sort of important to recognize where you're starting to, because I wonder if a lot of sort of the rejection of the idea of an absolute standard of beauty comes from the fact that we always start with ourselves and we're fallen in sin. And so if I want to start with an objective standard of beauty, that's a horrible thing to say to somebody. Like, like right. it just, it is like that's soul crushing uh, because right. none of us uh, 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 by creation, we're, we're corrupt in, in sin because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden. And so when we just start to look to ourselves, I understand why we would want to reject the standard of beauty and just go according to taste. And that then I, I have at least a chance to be okay. But if we start with what God creates and what, what he calls good, we can say, well, good probably has a, a, a look to it. Um, and, and that doesn't mean we're always going to be able to find it down here. But right. even sort of the, the pagans, like you said, the pagan philosophers recognized that, that there was something like math, that there was pattern, that, they, that there was order into it that uh, was better. Right. And, you know, that's, that's the thing that, about all this stuff that really cuts against the modern sort of philosophical move. In our present age, right, what we've done is we sort of 
Well, we sort of philo philosophized, I guess uh, that'll be a word. Well, we philosophized just sin. And so, and you know, like Augustine famously said, right, that, that sin is an inward curve on oneself. Well, we kind of academic, academically defended that with our modern philosophical moves. So, you know, truth is a matter of what I see and how I feel about it. And goodness is how I feel about it. We're all relativists now. And beauty is just, you know, in the eye of the beholder and all that, right? And so it all is defined by me. Whereas with the Christian, as with the classical pagan, we actually start with reality or God or something outside of ourselves. Now, of course, we start with God and his revealed word and kind of filter all things through that. But the idea is, is all of this ultimately finds its ground in the objective reality in which we participate and not in my own subjective experience of it. Right. And we, we hold both of these things. And so like you are still allowed to have tastes, right? Right. Absolutely. You know, you can like vanilla pudding better than chocolate pudding or vice versa. Um, you can like green more than red, but that doesn't mean that there aren't objective standards. And, and I think the place that really, for me, kind of is where the rubber hits the road, at least in our life as Christians, is when we come to discussions of like, you know, the so-called worship styles and mm -hmm. how we decorate our churches, right? You know, you go through the Old Testament, read Leviticus sometime, there is a whole lot of stuff that God says that he likes and serve in, in, in worship, right? There's a whole lot of things that he finds pleasing to him. And if we're going to worship the Most High God, then maybe we should start with what he's revealed to us, you know, about his preferences. I mean, I know that's kind of putting it kind of in a crass way, rather than starting with what we think is cool, right? Right. So when we, we talk about this, though, I, I think there's an understanding of it that goes inherent, even though... Um even though in a lot of cases, sometimes we just try to catch your eye by intentionally rejecting it. You right. know what I mean? Like um, we, we actually- well, in Modern art, right? Yeah. Modern art is this way. It's, it's a rejection of form and beauty and symmetry and all those things. And it's more meant to be shocking. Mm -hmm. you know, it catches our eye by its shocking, jarring qualities rather than by its beauty and its symmetry. There's something to that because I can stare at something beautiful for a long time, but something shocking, like, all right, as soon as you're done being shocked, you need something else to shock you or you, you, you sort of move on. Um, right. there, there actually is something to be said for, for meditation upon beauty then. So to, uh, to reflect upon this in God's word and promises. So I can, I, I can look at, at the creation that he has made. I can, I can even go into the, the worship service and recognize that when these, these, uh, these things that have been passed down to us are, are something to, to behold, we can stare at them for a long time. Whereas if it's always changing, to shock you, it's always going to need to change to shock you. And I know this because if I go 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30, and I look at these things, I can say, all right, that's a little dated. Right, right. And that's, and that's the problem that really comes with when we make things about trends and we make things about taste. Um, you know, go in, uh, well, my church, for example, we have beautiful green 1973 carpet, you know, in our, in our sanctuary. And everyone can tell when you look at it, it is from the 70s. Because that's when it was, I don't actually know when it was put in, but that's what it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about replacing it. And, and the general rule of thumb is because, uh, you know, just this is the way we think about things nowadays. A lot of people want to replace it with new carpet, which will also look dated in about 10 years. And, you know, we're trying to have the conversation here. Well, maybe we need to think about something more classic, something enduring, something that, you know, Christians have used for a long time. Like, why is it when you go to Europe, all the churches are, you know, clad in, in marble or something? Well, is it A, lasts forever, and B, because it looks nice, regardless of what era of history you're in. You don't have to replace it every few decades, you know, to keep up with the times, right? And, um, you know, there's something about that. And there's something also about how, you know, when we take things and fashion them, I mean, that's really where taste comes in, right? Natural okay. materials tend to have a more enduring quality because they're actually from God, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah. sure, they're corrupted with sin, but, you know, why do people want granite countertops in their house and not, you know, uh, poured concrete? Yeah, some people do that, but that was a big thing, what, in the 90s, early 2000s? And you can walk into a house and go, oh, hey, look, that's a that's a poured concrete countertop. That was from like 2006, you know? Right, and it doesn't mean that, that the other stuff is, is wrong. I mean, both of us are wearing polyester shirts right now, but at the same time, um, we, we can sort of recognize then that, that there is... Uh, there, there's something to behold that sort of stretches you outside of the now when it comes mm -hmm. to beauty. And that's that's maybe a good thing. Well, that, and I think the, the real central question for me in when it comes to aesthetics is the, the central questions are where does objective beauty, where do, where do they and taste overlap, right? Because mm -hmm. there are certain things that are objectively beautiful, but, you know, you wouldn't want to put it in your house. It just wouldn't fit there, right? Right. Or like, you know, how we appoint our churches, there are things that are objectively beautiful. Like you can go to the Vatican and see all kinds of beautiful statuary and, and artwork. And some of it would be really out of place in my church up here in North Dakota. It wouldn't fit. It wouldn't look right, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then there are other things that we have around here that if I were to put it in the Vatican, someone might say that's a little kitschy, but here it fits in because it's just, we're a simple church out in the country, you know? And, uh, and that, you know, that, that's really the thing. Cause like, I like, you know, linen and cotton fabrics. They feel nice. Polyester is not as fun to put on, but it's a lot cheaper. So, you know, <laughs> and it washes in the washing machine and I don't have to iron it. Right. And, uh, you know, these are the things that matter and, and they do impact how we see things and taste is important. But I guess the thing that I want to take away from this discussion, or I, I guess I want the people who are hearing this to take away, is that objective beauty comes first. Reality is actually the primary thing, and how we interact with it and prefer it comes secondary. And usually we invert those things. You know, we make it about what we want first, and then we go to reality. And I think that that's a, a mistake. And I know a lot of modern philosophy, all modern philosophy begins with me and works outward. I think that we need to actually start with reality as it presents itself to us, and then work back toward ourselves from that. Right. And, and so the takeaway from this isn't uh, something that, that your tastes are wrong or, or that your church is ugly or any of those things, but, but rather we can say this actually operates the exact same way we expect to interact with God. I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. And so if I'm just sort of left to pick what seems you know tasteful to me, I'm always going to pick something sinful. Uh, I'm always going to make an idol. And I need right. God to sort of come to, to Advent from outside of me to preach to me a, a pure, beautiful, saving gospel. And, and here we have a different way of thinking. Well, you know, and you brought up hymns. I mean, isn't there a whole bunch of, uh, there's a general refrain, I guess, in your, you know, your Holy Week hymns that like, look at this cross. Oh man, mm -hmm. it's ugly. It's so ugly that Jesus is dead on it. And yet it's the most beautiful thing in the world, right? There's an mm -hmm. objective, beautiful quality to this horrific, awful death, because it is in fact, where God has reconciled us to himself, forgiven our sins, gave us salvation, you know? Um, and, and, you know, this is the problem. If it came to a matter of taste, we would never talk about the cross. Because nobody no, wants to talk about it's, God like, dying. It's jarring. It, it's intentionally jarring. Right. And yet it's beautiful because of what it is and what it accomplishes. And, you right. know, that, that gets back to the mind of God. And what God says is beautiful is beautiful, whether we like it or not, you know. Um, and, and, you know, again, taste, it's not, it's not like you're sinful if you prefer one thing over another. Like, my favorite color is green. I prefer green things because it just appeals to me. One of my kids likes red. Another kid likes blue. Another kid likes red. Well, actually, he likes red and black. but not my colors and there's nothing wrong with that right or you know some people like to you know when i'm not dressed like a pastor i grew up on a farm so i wear flannel shirts and work boots and blue jeans right that's fine and some people like to wear slacks and and polos and some people you know like to wear a tie or whatever you know i just that doesn't mean one's better or worse than another right um and they are different tastes and uh, taste really more often i think comes into play when we talk about stuff we humans make you know, because that, that's where we start getting into our preferences. Because when okay. it comes to the natural world, that's by God's hand, right? And even when we try to manipulate that, like I built, built a golf course and I completely reshaped the land, there's, there's always sort of an artificial quality to it. Mm -hmm. You know, even if we kind of cover it up really well, you can tell it's been fiddled with, you know? Right. And even if it looks nice, it doesn't come across the same way as, say, a mountain swept vista where the sun's cracking up over the, you know, the next peak on the ridge, right? Um, and it just doesn't hit us the same way because it doesn't have that same objectivity to it. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is a, an interesting way to start to think. Um, and, and it's going to pull us outside of ourselves. That's that's worth doing. Yeah. Well, again, that's that's you know, this is if, if nobody else, if nothing else is taken from these videos that we've done, I hope people um, will at least appreciate the idea that maybe just maybe when it comes to thinking about the big questions of reality, that we should probably start with what God has made and not with how I feel about it. And that is so completely backwards to general society. I mean, everything is meant to be filtered through me. And I don't think that's helpful because everybody's different. Everyone has different tastes and preferences and different ideas and all this sort of thing. And there's nothing that binds us together. And at the end of the day, we'll just be sitting there arguing about a bunch of opinions because that's by definition all you have when I start with myself. Um, and we need to make that, that bold leap out into the world and say, this world is what it is and start there and start thinking about stuff, which is again, how everybody did philosophy before 1650, right? And then uh, after that, we've been retreating more and more to the inside until we get to, you know, postmodern philosophy, which is to heck with everything. All that we have left is getting our way. So, hey, let's just have some power over other people. Cool. And that's not exactly been helpful for us in our political discourse or anywhere else. <laughs> no, and I mean, this is something even Paul talks about. Should we just eat, drink, and be merry? Well, no, there, there's more than just this day. Um, so we, we've kind of covered the, the basic schools then of philosophy, haven't we? I think so. 
Yeah, so, the basic kind of subsets of it. Yeah. So how about this? In the new year, uh, come on back and we're going we're gonna to start to apply some of these ways of thinking to some of the stuff that's going on in the world. We'll, we'll start actually not just learning how to think, but thinking about the stuff that's going on. Well, you know, we can try to do that. But the problem with the world is, is that on the one hand, everything that is as new as old, right? Mm. As, as, as Solomon says, you know, right? There's nothing new under the sun. Vanity of vanities, right? All that stuff. Right. Ecclesiastes, love Ecclesiastes. I'm a you know, a sad Dane, at least partially. So I, I resonate with that. And I'm kind of prematurely a grumpy old man. So, <laughs> um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that also blends together in ways that get interesting because, you know, you start picking away at stuff and you can really go down the rabbit hole. And, uh, but the point is, I think you're right. I, I, you know, philosophy is great and all, but if it's an abstraction, what good is it? Right. And we're, we're Americans. We like stuff to do stuff. <laughs> I'm here for it. So uh, yeah, stick around uh, in the future and I'm looking forward to that. Pastor Brian Meyer, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day. Yeah, you as well. Thank you.